movement for the rights of the disabled of the marginalized of human rights in general nasim nasim was an in, indefatigable fighter she brought to the many struggles she was involved in a new spirit new ways of organizing and inspired all of us with her creative energy one of nasim hak's greatest contributions has been integrating health issues into the agenda of the women's movement in bangladesh focusing on women's health and reproductive rights she highlighted issues of maternal mortality a women's right to choose breast cancer awareness tobacco harm and so on the list can go on she was part of the national delegation to the international conference on population and development in cairo in 1994 where actually i met her for the first time she used this opportunity to convey the importance of advocacy with a stage to members of various movements and indeed shows all how movements have to operate on various fronts nasim hak also highlighted the responsibilities of health delivery services and systems regarding violence against women This was most pointedly made visible in the case of acid attacks, where health services and especially burn treatment had to be expected to deal with the terrible injuries that such attacks led to. Mental health services, which we often ignore, were also tapped, and Nasri, in her own way, talked of and provided many forms of counselling, such as music and song. that help to transform the lives of acid survivors similarly she highlighted the responsibilities of health and family planning professionals to respect women's needs and to place that for foremost about the greater public health goal of reducing family size she stressed that the latter would only work if the former is taken into cognizance and she did this by showcasing issues around the removal of no plan to the women who have side effects were denied access to services for the whole of the implant her activism finally led to improvements in delivery of services for no plan which has actually influenced a lot even within the indian feminist movement along with the other feminist movements from bangladesh and we learned a lot from those experiences too in our campaign against you know banning no plan in india Nasri introduced the idea of claiming accountability through the activation of oversight mechanisms as a means of ensuring improvement in health service delivery, especially to women. Her work in activating the Government Health Improvement Committee in five Upazila health complexes in different parts of Bangladesh in the 90s became the basis for a working. model of activist intervention to make state institutions function better this model was taken up by the regional women health organizations such as aro and others and introduced through a regional project in india pakistan and nepal nursing sat a slide was tragically cut short on 24 april 2006 her presence would have added even more energy and dynamism to our moments today today is her birthday on her 60th birthday that is 18th november we remember and celebrate her contributions to the moments so we end this tribute a song which is nursing favorite song and i as a friend of nursing i'm feeling bit honored to do this today thank you all the song
write up the health and drug policies script and edited as one of the members of the core committee of health for all. With deepest pain, we would like to have commemoration for paying the regards to his departed soul and blessings from all of us in association. The second one is for AFM Imamudi, a devoted health activist in Bangladesh. Some people always fight against inequalities and injustice to perform their sincere duties with devotion. AFM Imamudi was one of them who dedicated himself lifelong for the rights of the people who are denied and excluded. With the sorrows we lost him on 6 February 2009. We mourned his absence and would like to pay homage to his departed soul. He was born in Northern District in the year 1949. He got his MSc degree from University of Dhaka. He was blessed with one son and one daughter and supported by his wife. Comrade AFM Imam Uddin was a successful organizer and efficient mobilizer and connected to the speed of different movements as well as with the efforts of national, regional and global people's health movement. He took responsibility for Bangladesh chapter as the member secretary from 2002 till his death in 2009. He was a freedom fighter in the liberation war of Bangladesh in 1971. With the deepest pain, we would like to have commendation for paying the regards to his departed soul and blessings from all of us in solidarity. On behalf of the largest occasion of People's Health Movement, People's Health Assembly 4, People's Health Movement, Bangladesh, held in BCTM from 15 to 19 November 2018. Uh, 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 thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't now let's proceed with the session. I am Dr. Delen de La Paz and I'll be chairing this session. I'm a medical doctor from the Philippines. I teach at the University of the Philippines and has been the coordinator for the HM Philippines. I am the President of the Health Action for Human Rights in Philippines as well as the Chair of the Health Action Information Network. But before I call on the um, speakers, I was asked to make important announcements. I was asked to make important announcements. Everybody has to confirm their travel with a travel agency at 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock this afternoon. Today is the last day for confirming your flights back so that they will know how to schedule the vehicles that will take you back to the airport. Please do it at 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock at the lobby of the second floor. There is also again a reminder to please take care of your personal belongings. There is a need for volunteers to join a small group that will also make a statement on the sixth thematic strategy that was missed out, the strategy on war, occupation, refugees, and migrants. The group will be meeting at 1.30 in the BRAC lobby, so if there's anyone who would like to join that group, please be there at 1.30 BRAC lobby, the group that will discuss war, occupation, refugees, and migrants. Okay, so we have three speakers this morning. Our title is on the title of today's morning's today uh, morning's plenary is strengthening health systems to make them just, accountable, comprehensive, integrated, and networked. Our first speaker.
keeper is from Thailand. He is Rapibong Supanchaimat, and he works in International Health Policy Program, Ministry of Public Health in Thailand. He has written on the protection of health of migrants and universal health care, as well as issues in human resources for health in Thailand. He will be uh, leaving very soon after his talk because he has a flight to catch. So if there is any urgent question after his presentation, I can only take two questions. So please be brief with your questions. Okay. Thank you. Let's welcome Rabbi Bong Supan Chaimat. And then uh, at the sub we have 
the district level, that's the district hospitals. Now there are around 900 districts, at least a few districts in Thailand. We have around 77 uh, district hospitals. Some, dis some districts have uh, the higher level of hospitals, so called provincial hospitals. We have 76 administrative provinces, but, and we can cover uh, all of these provinces with the provincial hospitals. And we have the, uh, the, the regional hospital with super tertiary care. Yeah. So this is like an integrated network of healthcare infrastructure. Um, and this is like the health workforce. I already talked about the historical evolution, the healthcare infrastructure, but what about the human resources for health? You can see that there, there is an, uh, a continuing increase in doctor production, has a huge increase in nurse production. And there are several uh, measures. Uh, the, 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 most the most distinct one is around 1970. That there was a law that all new doctors have to go for rural service for around three years. This is like a mandatory rural service, right? In order to rotate all new doctors to rural, rural areas, we, we cannot expect uh, new doctors to, to stay at the rural areas for food, right? And we don't want that. We just want them to, to, to go there for some time and then replace by the new one. That's the way of life. But okay, this is the way that can this is the way we manage our uh, our our health human resources for health. And this policy is still in effect so far. And this is the uh, use of health code scheme. Or use of health or USC system in Thailand. We, uh, for the Thai, we have three main public health uh, insurance arrangements. The first one is uh, the civil servant medical benefit scheme. The second one is social security scheme for uh, private employees. Employees. But the most distinct one is the use of coverage scheme or the use we call the UCS scheme or UC scheme. Uh, some bodies mentioned this as the 30 bar scheme. If you recall in the media. Uh, several years ago. Uh, okay, its nickname is the 30 part team, and, it's, and it, is in, it was introduced in 2001, and that's the point, and that's the time point that we achieved with our health coverage. It covers 75% of the population. If you plus all these teams, it will come up to 99%, 200%. We can say that now all high nationals already achieved achieve new health coverage. Um, and we still extend, or uh, I have to say that we, at, we have been attempting, attempting to extend the coverage to my grand population in Thailand. And, and the top, uh, we, in 2004, we introduced, oh sorry, I, I spot this slide, it should be, in 2004, we uh, introduced the my grand insurance card scheme for my grand workers. And in, 2000, in 2010, uh, we introduced what we call stateless insurance for stateless people. So anyway, this is a long way to go because there are still some migrants who are uh, not covered by the insurance, but we, that's the way we have to, to go. Okay, what has been done and because this, this session, okay, this whole conference is more or less about the family health care, right? So I, will, I just introduce you about the health care infrastructure development, the evolution of the, uh, the evolution of use of health care in Thailand the human resources for health production scheme, right? So what about the primary health care? Okay, so I will go a bit slow now. What have been done? I will talk in three sections, so you can follow this uh, easily. First of all is, is we use the multi-sectoral policy action approach. Another approach is that we try to empower people and communities. And, and the, 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 last, the, last, the last domain is we use the approach of um, integrated network of health services. Let me go one by one. For the multi sectoral policy approach, you can see that, I, so like I mentioned earlier, I tried to show you the real cases of Thailand. So this is what we have done. It's already done. It's not in the plan. Like, okay. In the community level, we try to, we have, actually not try, we already created more ownership of the primary healthcare level. 
let's say there is huge involvement by the local government units and you already, already set the district health board it's like there is a district health board, it's like a committee you can think that this is like the, CEO, the health CEO for all the districts uh, the health CEO yeah, the board yeah, is comprised of uh, people from many uh, sectors not only the health professionals but also let's say the, go the district governors the community levels or even uh, religion representatives and this is up to it, uh, each district okay that's the community level right but what, what about the national level uh, you can see that we uh, based on the Ottawa Charter we already set up many foundations like the Thai Health Foundation which is budgeted or which is financed by the same tax that is an additional levy of 2% of uh, tobacco and alcohol tax in order to fund this foundation and the, this foundation will uh, is mandated to promote uh, an extensive campaign for health promotion and disease prevention for all for all uh, Thai people and the funding can be come from various sources when we call foundation, you may think that oh, this is like a foundation. Actually, this is the foundation that is already enacted by, by the law. And uh, representative from the government is only shared this form. So it's like a counterbalance, right? That, okay, this is not just a foundation, this is like a public foundation. So they can, uh, they can campaign or conduct health uh, disease prevention and health promotion campaigns based on. Uh, the accountability of the government as well. So, what about another one? This is like the National Health Commission Office. The National Health Commission Office is enacted and is established by the National Health Act in 2003. So, you have you have an act that is to, in order to ratify the establishment of the, of this organization. And we use uh, the concept of triangle that moves the mountain that I talked to you earlier. Uh, later, you can see that it enacted by law, the National Health Commission Office has to conduct what we call National Health Assembly every year. This is a, like an annual huge assembly. If some of you ever uh, join what called the World Health Assembly in the World Health, like in the World Health Organization, you can see the structure here. This is like very like the World Health Assembly, right? so that. In the World Health Assembly, you have representatives from every country, plus okay, some special organizations. This is the same. You have representatives from all, from all provinces, plus representatives from special organizations that negotiate with each other. We are not using the voting system, but you have to negotiate with each other in order to come up with a real solid resolution that is good for everybody. So, this is where we we uh, try to promote primary uh, health and uh, try to promote multi-sectoral involvement. This is the concept that we use in many organizations, not only the, the SEO. Uh, we call the triangle that moves the mountain concept, which is proposed by one of the senior scholars uh, in Thailand. And, and we use this approach in, in several, in several <laughs> programs and projects. We, the, the concept of this approach is that when you move, want to move something or you want to drive some public policy, you have, you have to link all of these three components. First, you need policy linkage, of course, right? You want to, to drive policy, you need policy linkage. Second, you, know, you need social movement, you need social power, power of citizens. And, and one of, not the most important thing, but equally important, is you, you need knowledge, you need an intelligent system. Otherwise, it's like if you want to move something, you use only the social movement. That's the big thing, right? If you have only knowledge, but you don't have any, uh, if you have only knowledge, you can, but you don't have any policy linkage or social movement, how can you drive? <coughs> if you have only policy linkage, but without knowledge, that nice, that, that is nightmare, right? You don't, you don't want nightmare, you don't want the evening, you want, the, you want to translate the agreement into policies. That's why you have to uh, link all of these three uh, things together. So, now you are, the PHM, I think you, you, you have been doing more on this section. 
but this is one thing that, okay, in the real world, we have to raise up this one as well, the knowledge one. How can you uh, raise, raise the capacity of the people? Not only the research, when they call knowledge, it's not the knowledge of the researchers, not the academics like me, but the knowledge of the people, knowledge, how can you raise capacity building uh, for the general population? Okay, that's the first approach. The second one is like, okay, how can you empower people and communities? Uh, you can start from the highest level. I uh, just mentioned you earlier about the main public health insurance in Thailand, the use of hopeless scheme, or the 30 bucks scheme. The use of hopeless scheme is governed by the UCE board, the UCS board, like the CEO, it's like the board here. Uh, it's not under the Ministry of Public Health, I would like to reiterate that. It is not under the Ministry of Public Health. The Ministry of Public Health or the hospitals, they are providers. But this is like the purchaser one, the one who controls the finance. Right? You have to split them, we call the purchaser and provider split, in order to raise accountability. And uh, who consists of the, the UCS board. You can see that the user conference scheme is governed by the UCS board. The board is chaired by the Ministry of Public Health. So this is like a counterbalance between the UC and the Ministry of Public Health. And there are several members under the board. You can see that for representative, there are four people from the professional houses who, chair, who, who sit in the board. But there are five, five NGOs or representatives from the city network chair in the board. And in the law, one of these five must be from the elderly citizen. So this is quite interesting. You can see that the number of the NGO residency out, already outnumbered the number of, of, the profit, of those from the professional households. So this is like how we counter balance it. So let's say this is like an example. I'm not, I'm not bad talking to the professional households. Let's say if they wish to let uh, prioritize or demolish this scheme, the representative from the civic networks or representative from the people will how to act this. Right? So this is how we govern, this is how we construct the UCS board and it's written by law. So it's not easily, you cannot easily uh, destroy all this structure. Okay, that's the highest level. Well, what about the grassroots level, so-called Okay, if you look at the village level, we establish what we call the village health volunteers, or you can see village health workers. Uh, they are volunteers, several illiterate. They are volunteers. They have their own work. Okay, they can reimburse some, some stipend, very small amount, as a covering cost, but this is the system that we establish for over 40, if I recall, already 30 years plus. And so they can do various functions, taking care of the elderly in the community, or uh, extending the NCD screening. Right? You cannot rely on, you cannot solely rely on health professionals to do NCD screening to all Thai people, unless you have huge amount of I mean, soldiers in the field, and these are our soldiers. And they can do other things like communicable diseases in some, in some area. They can help you uh, check the dogs, you know the dogs, right, for the TB, for, for the TB patients. Or help bring the malaria people dengue, to or control dengue. So they, they, they have done various functions in the village. And there is also the involvement of the local government of units that, that I already mentioned in the district of uh, issue. And what about the integration of the network of primary care? This is a, the this is the look of the health center in Thailand. Oh. Some district level. Okay, I think it's, it's quite okay, right? But the district health now now we now we, we don't call this the uh, health center. Its name already changed to health promoting hospital. But anyway, it's the same. Um, so around. <coughs> Over 8,000 to 9,000 sub-districts in Thailand are covered, another percent covered by this type of sub-district uh, sub health center or health promoting hospital. Uh, it is uh, supplied by at least one professional nurse 
at least one professional nurse plus uh, okay then in some in some areas there will be two or three professional nurse plus around two or three uh, public health officers plus the village health volunteers or village health workers that I mentioned earlier. So if you go to this if you are a resident <coughs> in a this sub district, you go to this sub district health center, you can receive any medical care for free. I want to read that free of charge. But okay, what if you if you are suff suffering with some severe diseases which are uh, which are beyond the capacity of the sub district health center, that sub district health center will refer you to let's say the district hospital, right? Because this is a sub district level, we refer you to sub district hospital. Free of charge as well. You go to you you have the referral sheet and you go to sub to the district hospital. You can receive services. If your diseases are more complicated than the capacity of the district hospital, it will refer you to the provincial hospital. If then to the regional hospital, then to your university hospital. So if you go to the this, this is how we uh, do in the universal health coverage scheme. Um, so, and, and I want to reiterate that when you call PSC, you have to, to redesign or rethink that PSC is not the poor quality care. If you have the PSC and you talk about PSC, PSC all the way, but you don't have the integration of infrastructure, uh, the networks of infrastructure, PSC may be prone of, and I'm not saying, may be prone of quality services, even though you don't want it to be. But if you have the implication of this network, you can, it can, you can be assured that the people will receive quality care without any incurring any financial hardship. Now, the benefit package of the social coverage scheme already extends to uh, less some high cost care, uh, like. Uh, chemotherapy uh, and renal transplantation, let alone the political diagnosis. So, these are some key outcomes of the healthy sector in USC in Thailand. So, that what we have done, and this is the outcome. So, I want to, this is to prove that, okay, these are some achievements. These are some achievements uh, that I, I'm born by the that they are funding, but I think it's okay now. I have only a few slides left. Now, these are some, I will talk about. First, with all these approaches, we can reduce catastrophic illnesses as well as increase income uh, redistribution. We can increase access and reduce the unmet needs. We can improve satisfaction of both providers and, and patients. I want to reiterate the term both, both providers and patients. And we can improve health, health equity and lastly, we can improve health outcomes. First, you can see this is the real evidence and all this evidence is already published in many international journals. Like, how can we reduce the care uh, the catastrophic health expenditure? So, this is the, the X-axis is the year in 2002. You can see that before, before the USD, yeah, before the USD era, Around 6% of the Thai population experience catastrophic illness. Catastrophic illness is that big, is that big, you have to pay some amount of more pocket. That's beyond acceptable level. And after you, the UHC, you can reduce uh, you can reduce the prevalence of catastrophic illness <coughs> around people from around 6% to around 2%. And you can see that those who benefit, those who, who benefit most from from the USD is those who are the first in time or the poorest group. Right. So it reduces all. Even you doesn't matter whether you are poor or you are rich, you can you can you can benefit from the from, from this from the USD. But those who benefit more is the one who are at the, the poorest in time. The dot line here. Okay. This is the utilization and unmet needs. Uh, I, I show you only this the graph show the increase the continuing increase in utilization both for the OP or the outpatient and for the IT. Right? And the unmet need level is around one percent, which is 
more or less equivalent to, to the prevalence of unmedi in the OECD countries. Uh, what about the satisfaction? You know, if you, if you look at the, the patients or the users, yeah, the graph here, yeah, you can see that after the start of the USC, uh, the, there is a gradual increase of the satisfaction level of the, of the patients from about 83% to around 90%. Uh, this is a survey that is done by the, that's by, by the UCS uh, governing body every year by its, by its regulation. So it must be, it has to, and it must be an annual survey every year in order to track and monitor this, uh, the satisfaction of the providers and the, the patients. And the results must be published online in order to, to this is like to, to make it accountable to the population. And the uh, provider also, and okay, from the start, the provider might not be happy, right? Because you shift the money from them to some extent. But anyway, with the gradual, there's with an increase, improvement in the management of the use of the use of the the, the satisfaction from the provider increased steadily. The life expectancy. You can see that the PUSD and the ProUSD, uh, our life expectancy increased gradually. Not speedily, but okay, at least but gradually from 70 years to now, over 75 years. Some key challenges. I went, this is, I think this is my, my uh, the, the last few slides. There are some few challenges. I'm not saying that the Thai health system strengthening approaches on our USC is the best in the world. I cannot say that. We are still facing some challenges. Like there is an aging population, the fast technological advancement. So there will be a likely increase in, in the healthcare expenditure. How can we contain the healthcare expenditure? There is an internal brain drain of the health workforce, shift from the public to the private one international trade and health, and increasing in the urban communities. So, how can we cope with this? this is, these are our challenges. Some take home message. In order to make the health system strengthening uh, happen in reality, you need good, good governance. Of course, you need good governance. Good governance, you have to, to make good balance of the, the governance of, of your, let's say, your uh, public interest and in IPs as well. Like I mentioned earlier, how can you construct the uh, composition of the uh, NGO representative and the professional representative in the UCS company uh, board? You need research. You cannot do this with just, with just uh, campaigns. But you need research in order to persuade or translate this into, into how to translate your, your dreams into real actions. And your approach must be on equitable health system. You need sustainable, adequate, fair, and equitable financing. That, that is what we call safe financing. So everything must, the, the financing system must be based on this issue. And you need to talk about it. I, okay, this is my last slide. All of this, I have talked about knowledge, talked about the political involvement. I have mentioned about um, the knowledge to the, and the social movement as well. But, Okay, you need spirit. This is most. This is what the health professionals, not only doctors, nurses, public health officers, and everybody in Thailand. Uh, we are taught. I'm a, I'm a physician by training. We are taught when we were in medical school that we have to follow uh, the spirit of the of our of the father of modern medicine in Thailand. This is a picture of uh, now. Now he's the. I think. I say that he is the grand, uh, the granddad of the current king of Thailand, the former, the, the, the father of the former king. Uh, he, he is a physician and he established many medical schools and this is the, some words that he left for our Thai professionals that the true success is not in learning but it is application to the benefit of mankind. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation.
the experience of Thailand in uh, making uh, UHC work, but we know that UHC is the slogan of health systems, but there are a lot of things that need to be discussed further vis-a-vis -vis UHC, but thank you for sharing the experience of Thailand. Considering that he has to leave, and if there is some burning, urgent question that I that you'd like to ask, only one question, given the limited time. Yes, please. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Shalom Sati, from Thailand as well. I work in four NGOs in Thailand, uh, the Access to Medicine, the GBS, and the People Movement for Health. Uh, thank you for the doctor to make a good presentation that uh, give the good image of the Thai USC that now progress. We have moved from the last 10 years ago. Uh, I believe him that we go to at a certain point of success and in terms of challenges, has, uh, he has uh, introduced already, but I would like to raise another challenge as well that we are facing right now. Um, right now, the military Thai government mm -hmm. trying to undermine the USC right now. They try to amend this ah. law, reduce the power of the representative of civil society in that community, and also to change the principle of the mm -hmm. USC system. Before, we believe in the, the cultural balance between mm -hmm. civil society, service provider, and uh, budget controller. It has been like that for 10 years, but right now they want to change the system. So it's our concern. The so civil society in Thailand has been opposed to this kind of effort by the Thai government to amend this law. But on the other hand, now they would like to change, uh, to introduce a new law. Uh, I can't remember exactly the official name of the law, but we call it super board law. It means mm. it's a law is uh, allowed to create a new body to control mm. all the healthcare system funds that have three main uh, healthcare system funds and also the other the health promotion institute as well. This board will have power to direct and have the policy that the other organizations we need that have to listen to that. So this is very a big concern in Thailand so far, huh. and I would like to raise this very urgent and very serious concern about the U.S. system in Thailand. That we are trying our best to oppose that, but under the elite military government, it's quite hard for us. We cannot do protests. We do protests, we can arrest it, or some you know, they're gonna send someone to your home to uh, the, to 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 threaten. Uh, your, your, your family member as well. So I would like to raise this as a quite uh, concern the, the issue. And right now we got a, uh, my friend, my colleague in Thailand, we are uh, good doing the, the press conference as well, criticizing this you know, the movement of the government that try to you know, undermine the healthcare okay system. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you. Um, one question, only one, please. Yes, uh, the lady raised her hand. The lady, sorry. The lady next to you. He was a, she was the one who raised her hand first. Uh, you have mentioned that budget from syntax. What is the syntax? Budget number one, number two. What is the percentage of the health budget in the GDP? Every package of cigarettes that you, <laughs> that, that you buy in Thailand, that's small amount of pack, right? That tax, 2% of that tax will go to, to the fund in order to promote, no promotion to the fund. Thank you. David? Thank you for a great talk and we're inspired by Thailand's <coughs> progress. But one of your last slides showed an increase in life expectancy uh, after introduction of UHC. So there's an implication that the only contributor to an increase in life expectancy is your UHC system, which I doubt very much. I'm quite sure that improvement in social determinants had something to do with that. In fact, may have been more important even than universal health coverage. So I think the slide's a bit misleading, and I'd like you to say a few words. Thank you. So to answer that, I'd like to say that the USC is not the... Okay, thank you for your 
for, for your comment, I have to say that it's like everything, every phenomenon in the world. Right? You cannot, this is in the real world, you cannot I mean, create, create this, this increase to, your, to only the USC, of course. But I, I think when you, call, when you say USC, USC is not just the insurance. USC is everything, the health and infrastructure development, uh, the, the address of the social determinants of health. I think this is what we call USC. USC is not insurance. So, okay, my slide might be misleading, but my message is that this is not the talk about the USC, but it's the talk about the health system strengthening as part of the USC. So, if you think that all of these things that we have done, I have said that all these things that we have done combined together lead to the increase in the life expectancy and many, many things in Thailand. And I, I want to reiterate that this is the real world. You cannot accredit the, the success to only one, uh, only one single approach. I just want to call on the lady who raised her hand first, the, the lady in pink. Please make the question brief, direct to the point. What is the GDP Thailand? Then how much GDP percentage is allotted to the healthcare for the public budget? The real, the, the amount, is, if I recall correctly, is now five. But I have to say it's GDP per capita, right? Not the GDP, so per capita, I think it's now five thousand, if I could call it, around five thousand US. Uh, now we are at the level, we are above the level of upper middle income benchmark. So, and the amount of the GDP that is distributed to help because the total health expenditure as percent GDP is now around 4 to 5 percent. Per person, around public. Public. Okay, general. You can use the term COVID expenditure, right? The public one. COVID health expenditure as percent. Uh, of total expenditure as percent of the total expenditure is about 7 to 8. Okay. So, majority of the health investment is from the public one. I'm sorry, I have to cut this short. There is another session later on health plans, so maybe we can ask it there. I hope other colleagues. So, let's thank uh, Robert Ball for his uh, presentation. He has to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, and that has set us up. So our second speaker is from uh, Colombia. He will be speaking in Spanish, so please get your headsets. Dr. Mauricio Torres is a medical doctor, member of the National Movement of Health and Social Security from Colombia, Latin America Association, and the Social Medicine, or ALADAS. He is a member of the PHM Regional Committee in Latin America. Friends, let us welcome Mauricio Torres. Good morning, everybody. I will speak in my modern time. I wish to uh, use translation for you can follow me. Bien, eh, buenos días a todos. Eh, yo eh, vengo de Colombia y eh, he planteado eh, en la presentación hablar sobre fortalecimientos del sistema de salud, diciendo por qué, para quién y cómo. Eh, si yo fuese a hacer lo mismo que hizo el compañero anterior, eh, hablar del sistema propio, tendría que hablar de Colombia para decir qué no se debe hacer para fortalecer un sistema de salud. El sistema de salud colombiano que ha sido mostrado como un gran 
éxito mundial realmente es un sistema que permanentemente viola el derecho a la salud. Por eso mi presentación no está relacionada con el sistema de salud colombiano, sino con otras reflexiones que me parece más importante para el contexto de la asamblea que estamos realizando. Bien, lo que yo quiero llamar en primera instancia la atención es el siguiente hecho. Nosotros hace mucho tiempo sabemos que los sistemas de salud solamente aportan un pequeño porcentaje en la producción social de la salud. Se habla que alrededor del 10% los sistemas de salud aportan la producción social de salud y que son otros determinantes los que realmente producen la salud de los pueblos. Pero también sabemos que en términos de gastos de salud, lo que más invierten las naciones es en los sistemas de salud. El mayor presupuesto de las naciones va derivado a los sistemas de salud. Pero adicionalmente sabemos que del conjunto de problemas de salud que tiene la población, el 80% se resuelve con la atención primaria. Y que las atenciones especializadas de segundo, tercero y cuarto nivel solo aportarían un 20% en la resolución de los problemas de salud. Si esta es la situación, yo creo que, que como movimiento tenemos que darle la justa medida al tema de los sistemas de salud. ¿Qué quiero decir? Que no es posible que los movimientos sociales que luchan por el derecho a la salud coloquen como elemento central de su agenda el tema fundamental de los sistemas de salud. Es decir, necesitamos poner el tema en su justa medida. Y eso, de alguna manera lo digo porque al revisar la agenda de esta asamblea, hay por lo menos 15 actividades que están relacionadas con el tema de la salud.